Right. Good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll get started. Um, I'm Anna Taylor, the Executive Director of the Food Foundation. Um, thank you all so much for, for joining us this afternoon for the next in our Quick Bites uh, webinar series. Um, for those of you that for this for whom this isn't the first time, you'll know that this is a um, very short webinar in conversation to reflect on recent events. Um, and this this time we're going to be actually looking back at the whole of the past year and reflecting on what's been going on in in food policy. Um, very much hope you'll find it useful. We're always looking for feedback, so please do let us know which what you like, what you didn't like. Um, you can always sign up to our newsletter on our homepage of our website uh, so that you can find out about future Quick Bites webinars as and when they happen. They're usually scheduled at quite short notice because they're reacting to current events. Um, and uh, today we're extremely lucky to have um, Corinna Hawkes with us. I'm sure many of you know Corinna. Um, she is the director and professor at the Centre for Food Policy at City University um, in London. Um, and I'm, we've been working, Corinna and I and the Food Foundation have been working together on and off for a good number of years now. And I'm really looking forward to having an opportunity to chat together about events of the past year and to hopefully leave on a hopeful note. But obviously there have been highs and lows this year and we'll try and cover some of those in the conversation. So thanks so much, Corinna, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for having me and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, we're going to start um, by sort of rewinding um, back to this time last year. Um, it was the uh, end of 2021 and it had been a pretty momentous year in terms of thinking about food system transformation at the international level because we'd had the first UN Food System Summit. And um, Corinna, you were obviously played a huge part in that summit and I mean, and have played a really vital part in leadership on these issues over the years. I'm really interested to know sort of how you came out of 2021 feeling, having having had that sort of momentous event, what your sort of hopes were going into 2022 and have any of those hopes been been realised? Well, the UN Food System Summit was uh, an important event. It was an important summit, as it were, because it kind of consolidated the narrative on food systems. And I think I do think the UK has been quite forward looking and relatively speaking to a lot of other countries, quite forward looking on food systems and it entered the conversation before the UN Food System Summit. But globally, the UN Food System Summit really made sure that food systems were became a fundamental part of the narrative uh, in this country and, and and around the world and that left me full of hope and uh, what I en um, ended that year was thinking we've the, the narratives have shifted there's more understanding of food systems thinking of doing now what we need to do is actually take a much more connected approach to food policy making we need to recognize all of the different elements of food policy that need to change to really make the food system fit for purpose in delivering on health sustainability and an economy and then all of these crises started to happen that you just couldn't have just couldn't have foreseen particularly of course the the war um, in, in, in Ukraine uh, with Russia and all of the, the effects of that. And it was just kind of like we'd had this big conversation about food systems and suddenly food systems were completely in crisis and they were they remain in crisis in this country and all over the world. And people are really, really suffering as a result of that crisis. So that had completely changed the landscape of the conversation and we're still in that situation. So. I guess things are better than they would have been if we hadn't had that conversation, but the the crises that have occurred since then have really made it a very difficult operating environment. And do you think they've, I mean, there was sort of some real concerns, I think, through when, when those crises really started to bite that we would actually see a lot of sort of rowing back on some of those you know, arguments that had been won really about the importance of making sure that we were, we're 
protecting the environment while we're thinking about global food security, for example, or um, really thinking about access to healthy food, not just any food at all. Um, but with the sort of global food security, you know, becoming kind of top of the global agenda, do you think we've we've lost ground there? Or do you think just things have just had to, uh, you know, be put to the side while we deal with the, the urgency of the, 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 the issues of the day? Yeah, well, what I think happened was that, and I think we need to reflect as a community on how we could have done better, is that there was a shift in conversation, but we never actually made the case of this is practically speaking what really thinking about food systems in a holistic way means. This is how you create co-benefits. This is how you manage trade-offs. Here are some practical ways of dealing with it. So it became this idea that sustainable diets and putting linking all of these things together it became a nice to not a need to it became a, a fanciful thing to achieve a vision of the future mm. whereas in the meantime we need to do these urgent things rather than understanding that the fact that we haven't taken a joined up approach to food systems is part of the reason that we have this crisis in the first place so uh, the crisis created a situation where it, it, people were running around immediately trying to get money in order to manage food aid so it absolutely led to some, it, it just kind of didn't, I wouldn't say it shelved it, I'd say it sidelined that, mm. um, that, that, that narrative. So the word is still used, but we, the, the task ahead really is to say what that means and, and what we need to do to take a food systems approach to addressing crises. And that's a task that we have as a, a, yeah. As a community. Yeah, absolutely. I think that might actually continue to be a bit of a theme in this conversation. Um, you touched on the fact that um, you, the UK was in a bit of a sort of front running position on some of these issues. And obviously, as we've taken, as we've then sort of stepped into 2022, we've seen, um, you know, a number actually policy being developed at different, you know, at different stages of development on a number of fronts relating to the issues that we all care around about around around food systems. And I'm interested to know to what extent you think the UK has kind of kept pace with that international thinking. If you felt that we were at the sort of forefront, do you feel that that's still the case, having seen what's happened during 2022? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, when I travelled abroad and talked to my many uh, colleagues, international colleagues, they were always interested in understanding what was going on in the UK as a forerunner of... Uh, of so many aspects of policy. And now I'm more likely to get people to say, oh, I'm really sorry for the situation that you're in. Um, it's, it's very sad that you're not able to even feed your own people. So I would say that the, the UK has fallen behind hugely reputationally um, and that the fact that it has backtracked and on, on certain uh, policy decisions that were made um, has done us a great deal of damage uh, in terms of um, of how we're seen. But of course, the important things is what we're actually, well, whether we're actually doing things and, and what we're actually doing. And I do see that there has been um, quite a lot of falling away in that area as well. So um, that has been sad, I think, to, to observe that. Yeah, and of course, we started the year with having seen the publication of the National Food Strategy, but not at that point, having seen the government's response to it. So let's just trot through. I mean, I'll just list some of the things that we've seen in terms of policy developments this year, just so that we've sort of got them in our in one place in our heads. We started off with the levelling up white paper, which had um, some some commitments around uh, school food monitoring, which have been more recently sort of elaborated on by the Food Standards Agency, um, and also a commitment around a community eat well programme, which is around social prescribing of fruit and veg and so forth. Um, we obviously had the the official response to the national food strategy. Um, we've also had. Um, the introduction of the location-based promotions of junk food, which kicked in on, in October, um, and the delay of the multi-buys and advertising um, of HFSS foods um, as well. 
Uh, we've had consultation on public procurement, um, a number of other uh, consultations sort of um, around animal welfare, various other aspects of around food. Um, what do you what do you think in from your perspective, what were the highlights? Anything you particularly like to see as being a kind of positive development on the backdrop of um, the points that you've just said about reputation more broadly? I mean, I think first off, this is the amount of developments is very positive um, and that really can't be underestimated that there was a, there was a real activity um, and that and that is meaningful. And not all countries are in that situation at all. And my highlight, I think, was the leveling up white paper and the school monitoring that you mentioned, uh, the monitoring of, of, of school meals are now being conducted uh, in, in a range of different places around the UK by the Food Standards Agency. Um, and why do I say about the levelling up white paper? I think it's because the the heart of the food crisis is inequalities um, and levelling up is about a, a lot about geographical disparity, of course. But I think at its heart, it's really about asking questions about inequality in this country, which is so corrosive in so many, so many different ways. So I actually thought it was quite a brave paper. Um, it was well set out. It talked about systemic change. It talks about different forms of capital that are needed in order to address um, uh, inequalities. And it has some very, very practical suggestions uh, of how to do that. And um, so I, I, I'm really, I really hope that the sentiment in that paper, clearly we have a different government now, but uh, I really hope that the sentiment in that paper is, is taken forward. Um, and um, and that the the specific activities are, are are implemented. Yeah, great. And obviously, the bill, the Leveling Up bill, is going through the Commons. I think it's at report stage now in the, in the Commons. And in fact, um, Emma Lure Buck, who's been on one of the, uh, it's been on the committee reviewing the bill, has also been proposing some amendments specifically around food insecurity, which has been good to see and really trying to make sure that food has a such a strong theme within the leveling up narrative. Um, I think my highlight um, that I want to just touch on is the commitment within the national food strategy uh, response um, uh, for, to do the food data transparency partnership. And while I realize this sounds somewhat technocratic and dry, um, at its heart is about trying to increase the transparency of business activity in food um, and in particular in the introduction of sales based metrics, which would allow us to all to see whether or not food sales are shifting towards better healthy, uh, healthier foods and and more sustainable foods. Um, I mean, I'm excited about this. I'm excited about it, particularly if it becomes mandatory. At the moment, there's no guarantees of that, um, though a suggestion that that this this reporting could become mandatory. Um, but it seems like the government is now starting to move on it, which is very good news um, now that things have sort of settled down a little bit with the new prime minister. Um, so that's good to see things starting to move on that front. But also I'm kind of excited by the prospects that if this data reporting can really be introduced um the ecosystem that can be created around that data whether it's through informing policy informing investors creating civil society pressure on companies that are not making fast enough progress it seems to me like it's on paper a fairly benign intervention but one which could really deliver a kind of multiple co-benefits um, out of that transparency agenda. Um, I think the other the other big sway of the policy, which ha haven't really um, mentioned yet, but which um, is sort of overwhelming in its volume is the um, retained EU law bill, which is uh, has now been laid before Parliament, Parliament. I think we expect it to get royal assent in the summer of 2023 and I've been staggered to learn about the huge number of laws which are within food particularly around food safety and um, novel products and a lot of animal feed products that are within scope which um, have got to all be um, either extended preserved or replaced 
before the sunset clause kicks in, which is currently uh, the end of 2023, though that can be extended, I believe, to, um, to 2026. So, I mean, in terms of the job of government and the job of the civil service in actually getting to the point where all of that vast amount of legislation can be transitioned um, to the UK statute in a more, in a more permanent footing I, is just extraordinary in terms of how on earth that's going to be possible. I don't know you've, if you've got particular reflections on that, but it seems sort of almost like we're worried, you know, we've been focusing on all of these little pieces of legislation, whereas this is like a ginormous, has ginormous implications for the ability of the rest of government to actually put forward some of the more progressive pieces of legislation. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite concerned about that. I, I am not convinced that there is sufficient capacity and yeah. uh, in government. I, I'm a huge admirer of of, of UK civil servants uh, in, in general uh, in terms of their skills and, and, and knowledge, but I am just worried structurally that the, that it's just not dealing with it. It's just not understood how to deal with it. Um, and that there's a huge job of work to really make sure that that happens effectively. Um, and it needs people to track it, it needs civil society to track what's going on mm -hmm. uh, in order to make sure there's transparency around that. And it, yeah. and it could suck away everything from all of the other activities. So it's it's like these layers of of act of, the, of these things that need to be done. Is this it's just huge. It's huge. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to um, we've obviously the one of the areas that's been most disappointing this year has been the steps backwards on obesity related policies. So I've already mentioned the uh, multi buys, the step away from the health disparities white paper and advertising. Um, do you think we should feel, I mean, how should we interpret these step backwards, these steps backwards, do you think? Um, how do, how does this sort of fit into the global context? Um, are we, why do you think they happened? Obviously, there are various reasons that are given for why they've happened. I'm interested to know what, what you really think. Yeah, I mean, that has been incredibly disappointing. And the, and the latest announcement about rolling back of the time for implement a time of implementation of the advertising restrictions is just one of many things that seem to have, have, have fallen uh, fallen back uh, very disappointing indeed um i mean i think that the um the situation of, of government uh, in this country in this past year should not be underestimated um and uh that what happened under the 44 days of of trust um were really um terrible in the sense of um of creating a sense of insecurity in the government and kind of losing confidence um, of, of what was going on um, in, in, in government. So whereas we entered that phase saying we need to have people um, more food secure or um, we, uh, there was a sort of sense of, of having to address energy bills and so on to this situation where even restricting advertising seemed to be somehow damaging desperately mm. to our economy and was going to you know going to be create all kinds of negative problems so i see a government that's really lost confidence in itself after um after this really you know very extreme situation that happened um and um and just seems to have lost confidence and lost any sense of courage that there is nothing wrong with creating a level playing field for competition for high performing businesses and um, that all of these these um, laws and, and and regulations that were proposed and are being rolled back, the, the, there's innovation in this country that can cope with them. And so there seems to be a general loss of confidence. Um, there seems to be a general loss of confidence um, about um, the uh, um, for the ability of industry to step up and cope, and for the ability of just the people of this country to cope with some more. Uh, regulations and laws that will only benefit um, many actors. So I, I see it as just a, a loss of confidence, and um, that's uh, I'm not seeing that change yet. Um, but it, I think, it is going to very detrimentally impact um, this government and its power to to affect change. Mm, I mean, I think. I, I mean, to add to that, I think we also just lost a huge amount of ground when when these issues became the. They sort of became totemic for 
the size of the state or the role of the state. Um, and in some ways, it, there was a much bigger argument being being had where 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 bog offs were used or or advertising restrictions were used as uh, the way into that much bigger, more fundamental set of arguments. And I, it feels to me like we we lost a huge amount of ground in that during that conversation. Um, yeah, and I think that relates back to what I was saying about confidence in the sense of of the confidence that government has a role. And that nanny statism, uh, which clearly some politicians, it's just a pure ideology and that's going to always be the case. That's not going to change. But it seemed to spread further um, the, these concerns that government would be seen as, as nanny state um, with yeah with the government at one point. Uh, uh, Liz Truss saying, well, you know, if we if we we want to have people to be able to make their own choices, you know, this restriction of price promotions isn't is is is, is taking away people's choice and 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 these these kinds of statements. So I I agree that has also um, I would say that concerns about nanny statism now run across uh, the political just across politics now, uh, which has always been there, but it's got even worse, and that's definitely a huge step back. Yeah, and it's interesting your point about uh, sort of losing confidence as well. I was uh, on Twitter today was a letter that the um, uh, that Neil O'Brien the under sec Parliamentary Undersecretary of State in the Department of Health had written to uh, uh, peers, I think, about the recent um, delay of the advertising restrictions. And it, it basically said, oh, kind of, we consulted industry. Industry said um, it was too, happening too fast, so we've delayed it. It was just a kind of, it was just sort of like, you know, well, you know, they've told us, so that's what we're going to do. Um, and it was it was very, in, that sort of lack of confidence point is sort of mirrored actually very clearly in that that letter, which is interesting and uh, somewhat depressing. Um, so let's move on to cost of living, which of course is really the primary concern when it comes to food now here in the UK and ensuring that people can actually afford to eat and afford to eat uh, in a way which protects their protects their long term health. Um, I mean, I, I'm interested to know whether you think um, you made a point earlier about, you know, whether we can really whether we're equipped, we're equipped well enough to be able to talk about sort of food emergencies through a kind of food systems perspective. Uh, I'm interested to know whether you think we're managing to do that in the UK at the moment for organizations like us or other, you know, others in this sort of space outside of government. Um, and, and I'm interested also to think about when hopefully this situation is going to get better, a bit better soon, at least getting inflation under control. Um, and, but I'm wondering how we come out of this and what the conversation is around food policy, having experienced this extremely serious crisis for for so many families what do you think yeah I mean not enough is being done uh, that's very evident um, but one of the things I'm excited about are the increasing number of conversations about how we produce food that people and nutritious foods that people can afford uh, which are also good for sustainability so it's the ultimate food policy problem it is the ultimate problem um, about how how you do that um, and is it all the, the the is it all down to supply or is it about getting demand and supply kind of working together in a more virtuous circle? So the bridging the gap work that I think Sustain have been uh, leading on and discussions that I've been part of at the Food Ethics Council, for example, do, what the work that you're taking forward and others and also at the community level are beginning to ask some serious questions about what what this looks like, um, how we can. Um, how to make sure that people have sufficient uh, healthy and, and nutritious foods that also serve, meet other food systems needs. So I'm, I'm excited by the civil society conversation that's going on. And I'm sure that conversation is also being held by some people, people in government, but it's not being enacted. It is a complex, it's, a, it's not an easy thing to address. It's really genuinely difficult. And as I said, if you look at the history of food policy, it is the, it is the mm. problem of food policy. Um, and um, but just in terms of meeting people's immediate needs, 
what isn't being talked about is like what why is it that people don't have sufficient means to afford food in the first place so there's things about this conversation about food banks there's a conversation about universal credit there's a conversation about kind of um how how you would address this uh, in the immediate term but the bigger question of what has happened to um to wages you know what has happened to the cost of housing all of these different issues they are fundamental questions about an unequal economy. So I think where the conversation now needs to go is around food policy, not so much as, uh, it's still important, but food in schools or food policy in schools or food policy for obesity or price promotions or environmental land management. These are all incredibly important, but actually reminding ourselves that food policy is economic policy. Economic policy is food policy. And the creation economic policy that creates inequalities, which our current economic policy does, is food policy. So I think there needs to be a, a widening out of the scope of how we see food policy um, and, um, and to focus on some of the real fundamentals, because otherwise we just run from crisis to crisis to crisis. And this mm -hmm. is particularly severe crisis, but crises are only going to get worse. Climate change is real. It's real. It's happening. Um, I, and, and when I go to uh, uh, countries in the continent of Africa, everyone is talking about climate change because everybody's very directly affected by it already, much more so than here. But that is happening here more and more, as we saw with the weather this year in, in, uh, um, in the climate related events during the during the summer period, for example. So we do need to broaden out the conversation about food policy if we're really going to start addressing some of these issues. And we're at a moment in time where government are just stalling. They're just not doing what they're meant to be doing for uh, for a whole host of different reasons. So this is the time where civil society, academia, community groups really need to unite so that they become united and cooperate and collaborate and coming up with a really good shared agenda so that when government is ready again, and it will be ready again, mm -hmm. we can pull that out of the drawer and say, right, this is the agenda. And it builds on what's been done. It's building on leveling up. It's building on the national food strategy. It's building on the years of obesity policy, all of that really solid ground. Um, that, that foundation has been built and it's beginning to show weaknesses. It's, it's crumbling. B different bits have been taken away, but it's not gone. So that, that's, um, mm. that's where I think we need to go. I mean, yeah, uh, that sort of leads into my uh, sort of, Positive, more positive thought I think to sort of end with obviously it's quite it's quite difficult to enter 2023 feeling we're you know trying to grab hold of those reasons to be hopeful or reasons to be cheerful um I think building on your point um if the fact that the the public I think has now uh, become you know a very there's a very broad base of public concern uh, around accessing food um, full stop, but also accessing healthier food to some extent as well, if you've not got much money. And I, sp I suppose I, if we're going to grab hold of some glimmers of sort of opportunity, perhaps, they might be that we're going to be entering, you know, an election period in the full, you know, not too distant future now. And you know, there. I, what I'm hoping is that we come out of this crisis with a, a clearer sense of sort of public purpose around being able to act for everybody, being able to actually afford um, to eat in a way which does protect their long term health um, and the environment. Um, and that that actually might try, as you say, take food a little bit out of, oh, we're going to do this little thing on obesity or we're going to do this little bit, little thing around food banks, but actually really centralise the conversation around affordability of good food. Um, and, you know, perhaps you never know, one of the political parties might actually decide to make that a sort of, you know, a, a genuine sort of signature focus. I mean, that's the challenge, right? And the opportunity. Um, and uh, we're entering into a period where those big ideas matter. Yeah, I would agree 100 percent with that, Anna, and, and that the opportunity is, is really there um, and not to be afraid of big ideas. In fact, this is the time to be advancing big ideas, to get people excited 
and uh, and the opportunity is there and i always have hope because when we see the 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 the, the engagement of young people uh, the strength of many people in the in our civil service the enormous commitment at local authority level which never ceases to amaze what people mm. manage to get done with practically no resources um there and then of course the great strength of civil society so the people are there um building confidence and building a sense of excitement and really focusing on on solutions um and really um being hopeful about that i think that's the that's the way forward it's so easy to get lost and caught up in all of the negativity and there has been a lot of negative things this year but it doesn't it doesn't solve it it doesn't help uh, moving forward and and just feeling the power of, and solidarity of of the community um mm -hmm. of, of care there's so many people who care in this country and yeah. that's what we need, we need to build on. On that note, um, thank you so much, Corinna. Really good to have an opportunity to talk through the issues with you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, uh, we're probably going to kick off the new year with what, a, a, a conversation which looks ahead at the year ahead and tries to pull out some of those opportunities which are on the horizon. Um, very much hope you'll join us then. And in the meantime, um, Everybody have a, a really lovely, um, restful time, peaceful time over the, the Christmas period and um, look forward to connecting with you all again soon. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.